There's a little something different for you guys on this week's episode with my friend Nate and Dan. We're going to be talking about understanding bird language for hunters and why the elk have a policy that snitches get stitches. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. What's happening, folks? How's it going? This is Jim Huntsman with the Western Huntsman Podcast coming at you with episode I don't know. I want to say it's either 64 or 65, but you know, you know me, I didn't check before I hit record, so I have no idea. Somewhere in the mid 60s. So, welcome to this week uh, coming at you from the Broken Tines uh, studio. If you listen to the bonus episode, uh, I still want to point out that it might be a bit echoey in here in the Broken Tines studio due to the, uh, the uh, little remodel going on i got all the uh you know the audio treatment equipment and stuff you know the the sound pads and all that off the walls right now and it is super echoey um anyways guys this week i got a crazy episode for you this is like a totally new different uh thing we've never done something like this other than i have had nate summers on the show he he was on the show almost exactly a year ago at some point uh he's the author of the the book uh primal And we talked about all things primal and the nature, or I'm sorry, the primal nature of humans and and, uh, how it relates to life today and connecting with nature. And uh, I'm going to get into all that in just a minute, but there's a few things that we need to cover before we get to this episode. And uh, stay tuned because I I think you guys are going to really like this episode. You're actually, it's going to surprise you. You're going to get a lot out of this as it pertains to hunters and how connecting with nature and learning bird language and things like that, man, just stay tuned. It's an amazing uh, discussion and I really, really liked it. And I think you're going to really like it as well. So uh, before we get to that, first off, first order of business for y'all. Uh, you like that? I threw in a little Texas a- accent because I noticed we had a lot of new listeners from Texas uh, the last couple of weeks. So that is for you guys down there in Texas. Y'all, I want to answer the trivia question from last week, uh, which is this is the one that you guys, there's like no, it, we're not giving out trophies for just anybody on this question. Uh, you had to get it right to be entered into the drawing. And this is the last question uh, for uh, before we do the drawing, which we're going to do the drawing next week. So hopefully you guys have answered the questions. If you haven't answered them all, go back and listen to what the questions were so you can answer them. Um, the, the question from last week was, if you jump on the Phelps website, the Phelps Game Calls website, and you are to answer the question of how many amp calls, diaphragm reads, does Phelps offer in their lineup at phelpsgamecalls.com? That, that's just for the elk calls, the amp Diaphragm reads at phelpsgamecalls.com. Any answer? Are you guys ready? The answer to that is 11. I even verified it with the bugler himself. So, 11 calls in their offering at phelpsgamecalls.com. So, you had to answer that right. Hopefully, you guys got it. I'm digging it. We got tons of answers on that one. And actually, most people were right. There was a few wrong ones, but most people got it right. Uh, And again, guys... Jim at the Western Huntsman.com. That's the email you send those trivia uh, questions, or I'm sorry, answers to the questions in. And we've got it all organized. Everybody's been really good about putting trivia in the subject line. So I'm able to take all those and kind of export those onto a spreadsheet. And it's going to go into my random drawing that we're going to do next week. And I'll announce the winner. The winner is going to be getting a Phelps game call package. Uh, we're going to have a bugle tube. We're going to have some reeds, uh, maybe a pouch and an external call, all that kind of stuff. Probably they usually throw in a sticker. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Speaking of that, uh, based on last week's episode, what was really funny is uh, we, ha- we ha- I had a lot of funny feedback off of that one because <laughs> we had <laughs> you guys that listened. We had the uh, the mighty, the well world renowned, well known uh, elk hunter Doug Flutie on the show last week. 
And a lot of you found that pretty funny. And I'm, I'm feeling like you didn't take it serious. <laughs> no, I'm totally kidding. But uh, what was super interesting is I got a really nice message from, uh, from Grandpappy Flutie. And I, I wanted to play that for you guys. I thought you might like this. Uh, hearing some of the feedback we get on the show is it's always fun. So listen in. Hey, Jim, this is Pappy Flutie. Yeah, just call to say thank you. I really appreciate getting you appreciate you getting my boy Doug on there on the show on the podcast and uh, you know, getting this being straight about that there expose that flim flam of a guy just a root get on my, my boy Doug. Yeah, he's a good lad and I just want everybody to know he what kind of a man he really is. So anyway, I really appreciate you getting him on there. And uh, spread the word, you know, the Fruity families have had a long proud tradition of calling in elk. So uh, you take care, Jim, and, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Oh, my. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> Grandpappy Flutie called in, and I'm glad he took it the right way because I did talk a little bit of shit about Doug right before the episode kicked off, and he must not have had his earring, or I'm sorry, his hearing aid turned up all the way or something. I don't know what to tell you, but uh, we appreciate hearing from you, Grandpappy Flutie. And obviously, we always enjoy hearing from Doug Flutie from last week. Okay, now let's get serious. Guys, If you, I don't know if you guys heard the bonus episode I did on uh, the, the announcement of the sponsorship with Tacticam, but I do want to throw in uh, the, the our uh, kind of a role for uh, Tacticam before we kick this episode off. Uh, guys, if you film your hunts or if you're interested in getting involved with filming your hunts, you need to check out Tacticam. Uh, Tacticam is the newest sponsor of the show. Uh, they've got a whole wide variety of different types of camera systems from like the 5.0 to the fisheye lens, depending on if you're fishing or hunting or just wanting to film scouting. Uh, the other equipment that they offer are things like your film through scope, the FTS. If you, you can attach that to your rifle scope, uh, in certain States, you got to make sure you're checking the regs on that before you just throw it on there. Because it, it, like in Idaho, you can't do that if you're hunting big game, but you can, if you're, you know, throwing rounds at a target or if you're hunting, uh, coyotes or turkeys or, or something along those lines. So, uh, the Tacticam is a 4k a digital recording device that's super easy to use. You can you, you control everything from one to several cameras right there on the app. It just connects to your app. Uh, you could zoom in, record, stop, pause, all sorts of stuff right there on the app. They also have things like the reveal uh, cell cam. So if you're managing land or you have it set somewhere in your hunting area where you do have that service, you can get pictures sent to you on, to your phone uh, in real time. It's really cool. Uh, piece of piece of equipment, and uh, I'm I'm super excited about this uh, sponsorship and this partnership that we we formed with Tacticam. Uh, it's going to be a great one because I, I think that a lot of you guys are like me. We don't know how to really go about filming these hunting trips the right way. You know, with with this type of action cam or POV cam, which most of them take really crappy footage. They take bad. They've got bad audio. The depth perception is way out of whack. Not the case with Tacticam. So check out Tacticam.com and see if they've got something that makes sense to you. If you don't want to learn how to use a full-on you know, video camera out there while hunting, uh, just pick up a Tacticam because it's super easy. Like you, you just push the button a few times and you're recording. Um, so it's it's a great product. Guys, check it out. We're proud of uh, them coming on board as a, as a sponsor, and, and we really appreciate that support. So with that said, guys, this episode... Um, like I told you, I've got Nate Summers, who is a return guest, and I've got Dan Gardoki on, uh, both of which are, uh, they are not like what we usually have on the show in terms of like mainstream hunters. These guys are survivalists, they're naturalists, uh, they're hunters, they're gatherers, they, they are the type of dudes that can walk off into the woods with very little, next to nothing on their back, and and survive. They they teach classes on survival. They teach uh, classes on on hunting uh, techniques with using bird language and how that how that can relate to hunting. And they teach survival classes. Uh, Nate has a new book coming out, and you guys need to check this book out. It's it's because it's his first one. That's how I found Nate. Is actually I was I was in Grangeville, Idaho. And I had walked into this truck stop. I was coming through Grangeville, going to this truck stop, and there's this book on the on the shelf. And the and there's a bunch of books, right? And they're like high-end books. And I'm looking at the, all these different books, and I had a couple of days to burn or whatever. And I see this book called Primal sitting there. And uh, I picked it up. 
and Nate is the author of this book. Great book. So if you don't, have, if you've never read Primal, it's it's worth the read. You should pick that up. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, and then also he's got a book coming out in about a week or so called Awakening Fire. And it's all about fire and what burns, how to make the proper fire. And we talk about it in the, in the episode. So I don't want to, I don't want to like duel up on that one. Uh, but Dan also, Dan Gardoki has a website called Lead with Nature. And he does all sorts of classes on, on bird language and, and animal tracking. Uh, and, and things his websites, uh, super interesting. So jump on there and check that out with these guys. You guys are going to get a lot out of this. If some of you are listening to this thinking, uh, what, what in the hell is bird language going to, how is that going to pertain to Western big game hunting guys? You're going to be super surprised because if you, if you pay attention to what, what these guys, they, they have a totally different perception than, than what is the norm within the hunting industry, right? This, this, it's a totally different view that we're, we're coming at this with. And, and you'd be well to be open-minded to it because there's a lot of information that I learned and you're going to learn too as we, as we kind of walk through this. And we're just basically touching the surface. These guys have a more advanced class, if you're interested, that's coming out in April and that'll be in the show notes. Um, again, guys, I think you're going to really like this episode. Enjoy it. And with that said, guys, thanks a bunch for tuning in. Check us out on Instagram. Check us out on Facebook at the western huntsman on all of that stuff and you can check out the western huntsman.com we appreciate you sharing these episodes with friends and family those who you think would benefit from listening to the information we provide here at the western huntsman.com we or i'm sorry at the western huntsman podcast <laughs> i'm quite tongue-tied today i tell you what all right guys let's kick it uh let's kick it off with dan and nate enjoy this episode we'll talk to you soon thanks guys this week guys i've got a really interesting conversation we're going to be we're going to be talking about um it's something that doesn't usually mesh or or uh, the the bridge is not crossed a lot when we're talking about uh like your mainstream hunters and how they can mesh kind of a naturalist view of of wildlife and nature uh and specifically using bird language and so you guys might remember about a year ago I had author Nate Summers on the show, and we talked about his book, Primal. And it was a really good conversation that we had kind of centered on that book. And uh, Nate is back, and he is joined with Dan. I totally forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name, and I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to try, okay? Dan Gardokwai? How'd I do? Uh, Gardoki. Dan Gardoki. Just look like, yeah, look like, oh, okie dokie. That'll work. (laughs) Perfect. So Dan Gardoki. And uh, Dan has a website called leadwithnature.com. Uh, Nate has the website uh, primal.com. I, I, is it still primal.com, Nate? Uh, it's primalnate.com, www.primalnate.com. Prim- primal Nate. So, guys, I appreciate you coming back on the show. Thanks a bunch for being here, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Jim. We're happy to be here. Let's kick us off real quick and, and kind of refamiliarize everybody with Nate. Um, give us your, your background. Again, Nate is the author of uh, the book that we talked about last year called Primal, and he's got a new one that I'm pretty excited about called Awakening Fire. Uh, Nate, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and tell us a little bit about, about yourself? Yeah, yeah, Jim. Well, um, I'd, I'd love to share a little bit about that. And uh, yeah, I, I wrote Primal a couple years ago and it came out last year. And I, I loved, you know, coming on the show last year and sharing with this audience. And, you know, really the, the, the core idea behind that book is that on some level, really all of us, all human beings, hunters included, are really hardwired in our brains to still be hunter gatherers. And it's this idea that our society has, you know, progressed and done different things, but our biology hasn't changed that much. And so we have these these deep longings to, uh, you know, wander the the earth, you know, hunt, fish, gather, and also the core idea too that all of those things that we might kind of consider as specialized things these days, like hunting or survival skills or foraging or wild edibles. 
that really those weren't separated for people for a very long time. They were sort of everybody's profession, you know, and like mm-hmm. these days, you know, maybe I have the profession of I, I'm a, a writer, I'm an author, I, I teach online and I, you know, get to go, you know, forage with my family and, and you know, fish in my bioregion. But really, you know, once upon a time, we were all doing all these things. And um, and so, you know, and the first time I was on, Jim, we, we talked a little bit about bird language as this core deep nature connection practice and and maybe the the one that you know kept our ancestors alive the the, the most um this idea that it, it lets us know where the animals are especially predators and and you know can help us uh, be more safe out there but also point us to where animals might be so i'm excited to talk about that today and um and i will mention yeah briefly jim thank you for bringing it up I, my second book awakening fires coming out And it's a field guide to making fire. And it's really about that essential survival skill that I I really feel like everybody should know how to do. I kind of feel Mm -hmm. like it's one of those core practices people should have to do before they're allowed to go out, you know, hunting or backpacking or even, you know, camping. You know, it's like you should just know how to make a fire. And, um, yeah, I'm really uh, excited to have my friend Dan along today. I, I think of Dan as a as a big brother and a, like a mentor in these things. We've had some of the same teachers, and he's just an incredible naturalist, a solid tracker, a good hunter, and he really melds all the things I talked about in Primal together into um, his life and his lifestyle. So thanks, Jim. Awesome. So uh, real quick before we before we move to Dan, I want to talk just real brief uh, with Awakening Fire. When you say it's all about making fire. Uh, yeah. what, what do you mean by that? It, it, are, do you go through different processes like, uh, you know, different methods of lighting fire, how to maintain fire, you know, kind of give us a little bit more insight as to what the book is going to talk about. Cause it's more from like a survivalist standpoint, right? Yeah, totally. Totally. I, you know, I, I've really been excited about where field guides have gone in the last say 10 to 15 years. I think they've just become more fun and exciting and interesting. And, it is a field guide. Uh, the, there's an intro section about humans and fire. It gets into kind of that ancestral relationship I was talking about. But the middle mm-hmm, third of mm-hmm. the book is really all about a how-to of how to make fire under all sorts of conditions, using different ignition methods. You know, what are the key components of fire? What do you need to know about fire safety? You know, what's a good fire structure for when it's really windy? How do you cook on fire? And But then the last part, which is is was probably the most ambitious and definitely a little bit on the challenging side is it has a, a, it's a guide to useful species for all over basically the entire United States. So what are the most useful fire making species in different bioregions? So you could literally carry this book with you around the country and know what trees and plants to use to make a fire in different areas. So. Oh, see, that's that's really interesting to me. I kind of geek out on fire stuff, so uh, I I really am excited about that book. Uh, is it out now, or is it available now, or when when is it available? Yeah, you can you can order it online now. It comes out April first as the official release date. So you know, by the time this okay. podcast is coming out, it will pr- probably be available within days, if not already on the bookshelves. Okay, cool. Good deal, man. Well, congratulations on the new book. I think that's uh, that's awesome. It's a great topic. Uh, I think there's a lot of people, and I think we talked about this last time. There's a lot of people that have some major misconceptions as to how fires work, and I I run into it all the time. I see these folks out, and they're just wanting to take their family camping, and they get these uh, total green live log rounds, throw <laughs> gas yeah. on them and expect yeah. this nice hot fire to roast marshmallows on. Right. And it just doesn't yeah. work. And so, oh. um, yeah. that's, uh, that's going to be a super helpful guide, I think for a lot of people and, and, uh, they'll, they'll really benefit from it. So looking forward to that, man. Cool. I appreciate you sharing. Um, let's switch to Dan, Dan, give us a little bird's yeah. eye view. Uh, no pun intended with the topic we're talking about oh. today, but, uh, Give us a little bit of background on you and and uh, your your mission and your website and things, and we'll we'll take it from there. No problem. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm a um, I'm a I'm a lifelong learner and educator, man. I've always been excited about nature and uh, and always wanting to learn more. So that's that's taken many different forms over my life. Um, 
I got I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, uh, which actually pretty interesting, diverse place. Actually, has quite a bit of hunting and fishing, as mm-hmm. some people might be surprised to hear. But um, I <laughs> wasn't tied into that world at that age. Um, I was a suburban kid. I was playing in the woods, creeks, backyards, that kind of stuff, getting a little trouble. Nothing too crazy. Um, and it wasn't, but I didn't have anyone in my life who really, I mean, my dad would take me fishing here and again. I'd pop on my bike with a fishing pole, ride down to a pond and, you know, fish for crappies or something, but nothing too crazy. Every once in a while, a little deep sea fishing. And, um, as I got older, um, I really started getting more into, into wildlife. I just was really curious. I found myself just always trying to track wildlife, learn about wildlife tracking, learn about birds, learn about really all at many aspects of nature, insects, you name it, uh, ecosystems, soils. Like I just started geeking out on it all. Um, I had a great mentor, a uh, high school teacher who kind of got me excited about all that and had me starting to, you know, teach kids uh, to be outside and play and have a good old time. I was working with little homeschool groups. I was starting to work on the weekends for as an educator. And so I just, you know, never stopped learning. I mean, nature's an endless book, right? You just can keep going and going. There's yeah, just, for sure. It's, it's yep. always humbling you. You learn something new only to learn <laughs> you didn't know 10 other things. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, that's kind of how I went down. Um, that's how I kind of, I started going down that path. And uh, I got really interested in, in the vocalizations and the commu- just basically bird behavior. Um, you know, I was, wasn't crazy about the whole checking off birds on a big list and running around chasing rare birds. I mean, I did some of that just to learn them. Hung out with a lot of kind of old birding elders, like Audubon type folks, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and that was helpful. It was helpful. I got to band birds, hold birds in my hand. That was really freaking cool. Loved, loved it. But then, um, you know, I really just wanted to, I felt like there was so much more we were missing about what birds were saying. And I started to notice all the, all the things that birds, you know, all the communication, the body language. I started to just see how other animals paid attention to birds. So I noticed how squirrels are listening to birds and chipmunks. And then eventually how, you know, uh, foxes and groundhogs and badgers or whatever it is. I mean, so many different species were all basically sharing a language. And I remember being a kid and hearing this, some old story. I don't know who the heck told me it, but it, said, it started off with this, uh, it's like one of those old fables and said, once upon a time, when all the animals spoke the same language, dot, dot, dot. And that line really stuck mm-hmm. with me. And I always be like, what is that language? You know, like, and so I've spent a lot of my life trying to figure out that language and, and learn about it and share it with others, uh, the little insights I've had. Um, so, you know, sometimes we call it bird language. Um, you know, I teach some online courses, I got something called talking with birds and it's not just about birds though, but birds are the gateway to this deeper kind of language that all the animals are speaking. And, you know, I, I just, you know, Frankly, what's happening is, you know, wildlife are all communicating. And most mm-hmm. of the time, almost all the species are all listening to each other, whether they're actually reacting or not. Right. But we know they're paying attention. Like you can't go stomping into a forest, as hunters know, and not expect to spook ground birds or, you know, or crows or ravens or something and, and then spook those elk a half mile ahead. They're going to see that concentric ring. Like I think about the human you know, I think about the way we move and the way we set, set out uh, kind of, yeah, like like basically ripples in a pond. If we're not, if we're not quiet, if we're not still, et cetera, uh, you know, there's many ways we kind of trigger animals and then we lose our advantage when we're trying to get close to them. So I got really excited about it. Didn't picked up hunting as an adult in my early to mid twenties when I just wanted to find a good source of healthy local wild protein. Um, uh, and so I, you know, learned the hard way. Didn't really know much about uh, much about the technical side of hunting, but I knew a lot about nature. So it wasn't too crazy a transition for me. Um, I still consider myself a learner, um, but you know, I've had a nice couple decades now of you know mm-hmm. gradual mm-hmm. success and fuller freezers. Are you uh, still in? Years. Are you still in New Jersey or? Nope. No. So I moved to New England. I'm in Maine. Um, in Southern Maine. I've been up here for 20 years. Oh, okay. And that's where I started. That's yeah. So I started my hunting up here. Yeah. I missed that whole chapter. But anyway, yeah. So, um, you know, for, for 20 of those years, I, I was started and ran a whole nonprofit that was all about getting kids outdoors and families. Uh, and I did that for a long time. And a couple of years ago, I just handed that off and I was just getting too, too crazy. And I was like, I want to get back to my roots. And so I'm a registered Maine guide. I do guiding. I do workshops. I do classes. I do online stuff. I do some consulting work, so I'm all over the place, um, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. kind of getting back to some of that stuff and really enjoy it. So, yeah, uh, well, that's that's the quick and dirty. It's it's super interesting. What what I like about having you guys on the show uh, and and what kind of how I, I started this episode was was talking about, 
you, you know, there, there is like a couple of sides or angles that we're coming at this from. Like you guys have this survivalist naturalist kind of philosophy, right? And, and hunters, there's this mainstream hunters where a lot of it's all about, you know, what kind of new technical gear do you, do you have? What kind of pack are you, are you yep. running? And, and, uh, yeah, you oh, know, yeah. so even some of the advanced technology, like the, the incredible satellite imagery, we can, we can walk around in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone service and still see on our phones. You know, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But what, what I really like is we're kind of talking about, uh, and Nate's book speaks to this, that the name of the book is Primal. And, and we're, we're meshing these worlds where there is this humanistic uh, primal urge in all hunters. And, and I, I feel like it's in every human, hunter or non-hunter. And yeah. the, the difference is, is, is like for guys like me, I, I harness that. And a lot of people, uh, I think they've lost that. And I think that that has created this sense of dependency in a society that misses that and souls are like lost. And I don't mean to sound overly philosophical about it, but I, I feel like we have a lot of lost souls in the modern world because they don't have this connection with nature. They don't have things like uh, what we're going to talk about with bird language and, and a connection yeah. to the, the hunter gatherer type kind of lifestyle that, that is what makes up human uh, his, history. And so that's, I, I don't know if I explain that right, but that that's why I'm excited about this. And uh, I want to come at this conversation from, you know, I, I, I know a very, very basic elementary kind of bird language. If you're if you're talking about that and, and uh, you know, I think Nate and I talked about this last year where, you know, I learned at an early age when I'm calling coyotes, uh, let's say, you know, and I used to do that quite a bit for farmers uh, to kind of call the coyotes that were creating havoc on on their, you know, farms and, and ranches and things. Uh, they, they would hire me and, and other guys mm-hmm. that would go out and we'd call the coyotes in and, um, we'd, we'd harvest these coyotes. We'd get these coyotes. And so, uh, I learned early on that the birds will tell you where the coyotes are at. And, wow. and if there's a coyote coming in, the, the, the birds are going to follow that because the, the, the birds want what the coyote leaves. Right. And so, yeah. um, they're, they're following these, these coyotes and, and they'll, they'll kind of communicate with each other. I never knew what they were saying to each other, but I always knew when something was, a, was going on or, or something was coming my way. Um, and, and again, same thing when, it, in terms of like bear hunting, uh, you can, you can kind of know the general, um, area of where a bear might be coming up a draw based on how the birds are moving. And I don't, they, they don't make a lot of noise from what I've seen, but uh, you guys are going to help me understand all that here in a minute. So, so that's basically laying out my very elementary understanding of bird language. And so that's uh, where I kind of want to kick this conversation off. Can you guys, uh, and, and I don't care who starts this out, but give, give us like yeah. just a, a general summary of what bird language is, and then we could dive into the details of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm happy to take that, Nate. Do you want me to run with it? Yeah, go for it, Dan. So, I, yeah, right on, Jim. I, I think we're talking the same language here. So I think the first thing for people to understand is uh, the importance of having a baseline understanding of what's going on in a place, right? So say it's just like the difference between hunting the woods out back where you live or, or you know, the mountains or when you travel somewhere else and hunting those places. You know, it takes when you've scouted a place, you've hunted there year after year, you kind of know the baseline of that place. You know what to expect in terms of changing of the, uh, you know, dropping of leaves and the, uh, you know, the this movement of certain species when they're hibernating, and when they're not, uh, the rut, everything, right? You just kind of have a good feel for it. Mm-hmm. But when you travel somewhere far off, you might not feel that comfortable. You might not know all this information and it's easy to misread and misunderstand what's happening. Um, so I just call this baseline. So if you have a good baseline knowledge, a good real deep sense of place, in an area, um, that's that, that foundation is critical for interpreting uh, these, this bird language thing we're talking about more accurately. Yeah. You know, it's super, super helpful. That being said, there are some characteristics that are universal and don't really matter. And I've traveled to other parts of the world and, you know, I've hopped off a plane and was asked to teach a workshop the next day and be like, all right, <laughs> just going to go with the things I know are true in other places I've been. I don't know the names of any of these critters. I don't know this elk from, you know, that antelope from that squirrel from that uh, crow. But, you know, mm-hmm. they're antelope and they're crow and they're squirrels. So they're going to they have there's a language I know from them. 
So that baseline is, is really important. And I think actually it, that ties back to your idea of this kind of lost soul thing. I mean, you know, since we, you know, since, uh, you know, at least, you know, my family, you know, I come from, uh, my mother's a Newfoundlander, my dad's a first generation immigrant from the Basque country. And, uh, you know, those people, they were displaced from their land a long time ago, too, just like the natives in this country have been. And most of mm-hmm. us around the world had some sort of displacement. And, uh, you know, and th- as painful as those processes can be, they've brought some some terrible things and some wonderful things to our lives. But, the, you know, the thing, the nature of it, the thing is displacement disrupts that idea of a baseline. So we don't really know a place that well. Whereas if you have an un- uninterrupted deep connection with one place, like where I live here in Maine, we have, a, which is this area where I am now, is a Wabanaki territory. And actually, the Wabanaki, we have four different bands or tribes in this region who are still here, despite everything that's happened to them. And they have an uninterrupted connection with this landscape. And they've got stories and place names and moon teachings and you name it uh, that are all about this place for 12,000 years. That's, yeah. that's amazing. I mean, that's, that's super amazing. I mean, that's, right? that's a so lot that, of history. Right. It's one of the few regions in of the country where they weren't where natives weren't displaced and sent on some reservation somewhere else. So, I mean, there's definitely others. Right. But um, anyway, I just mentioned that because that kind of connection and depth of knowledge and understanding of that baseline helps. Right? It, it gives you a real jump start. So mm-hmm. bird language is basically knowing that and then tracking kind of paying attention to putting our energy toward changes in that so when something is off when something is wrong when something in your gut tells you hmm right and as hunters we all know this we all have these moments and sometimes we're right sometimes we're wrong sometimes we have a hunch we have our instincts right and those are just all our senses i think you know i think we talk about the five senses but i mean i'm pretty dang sure humans probably have at least a dozen (laughs) we just don't know how to name them yeah we just things that we just know when so many things we know so I think we, we're touching into those, we're developing in those senses by doing a lot of the things that Nate talks about in his book, Primal. And when we talk about this idea of bird language, there are practices and you know habits we can take on that will help us kind of fine tune those senses so that we will better be, able, better be able to detect when things are happening around us. Because it's just so darn easy to miss. I mean, how many times have you been hunting somewhere for a while and then you get up and you spook something on the way out that was real close to you or you see tracks on the snow or like 30 yards from you you had no clue they were there yeah so it happens all the time it happens all the time and there's actually been times when i know that it was the birds that alerted the the game that i was in pursuit of you know and and they were they were out of there and 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 they didn't know i was there i was you know i i'm i'm very big on wind and watching the thermals and 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 scent control and all these things and 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 you wonder gosh how did that how did that elk or how did that white-tailed deer know i was coming and when when you kind of when you kind of sit there and you interpret what just happened in the last you know few hours or whatever it's like okay I did spook the birds. The birds knew I was coming. They made a lot of noise. They went that way. And I'm, you, there's no other explanation other than yeah. that wild game picked up on those birds. Right. You know, so Nate and I, over the years, we've taught stuff together back when and, you know, week long workshops on this stuff. And you know, it's fascinating. The first thing, one of the first things I realized is most people don't give wild animals enough credit. Now, hunters tend to be an exception. We some some not some still sell them short, and I don't know what the hell you guys are thinking because they outwit us the vast majority of the time. These animals have evolved to survive on this planet in this place for some of the mil- many millions of years, and the ones we're seeing are the ants are, are the descendants of all the smart ones that didn't get killed. So yep. they're wicked smart. <laughs> so exactly. you know that's the first thing is we need to check our own egos as human beings, and we need to humble ourselves and assume that. There is much more going on that we even have a we're even capable of detecting. And I think that shift internally, that humility, that that, you know, will help us be better observers and better hunters because we're going to be more likely to pay attention. We're going to be asking ourselves, what am I missing right now? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. What am I not even thinking of? Who's watching me? You know, who's hunting the hunter? Who's keeping an eye on you while you're trying to glass the other side of the ridge? So there's always something, you know, it's just always to remind ourselves that. We are probably being outgamed most of the time, and that's okay. But let's think that way, and let's let's assume it's happening, and we're more likely to detect more things happening right around us. Yeah, and I, I mean that's not even probably. We are being outgamed all the time. Yes, you, you yes. know, as a, they, it, it's funny. You you made a really good point um, that we we kind of underestimate the the animals. Yep. 
Uh, and I think that people, especially newer hunters, um, that, that, you know, maybe, maybe they've just never really been exposed to nature. They grew up in a super urban area or something along those lines where they go out and they have this like mindset that the, they're the first human to be in that, that particular little yeah. area, you know, that like they're the first, it's the first time. And this could happen in places like Alaska or Canada. Sure. But, sure. uh, usually you're not the first human that elk has seen. And, yep. and they've been doing this, like you said, for generations, passing it down. And just like, just like humans have things that we pass down to our generations, uh, animals right. have done that as well. And it's very instinctual. Um, and, and so I, and what is like the, with, in terms of bird language, there is some kind of historical context we could talk about there, right? I mean, the, I know, um, I can't remember where I was reading this, but the, the, there was a native tribe that, uh, they didn't document, but they passed down the story of how to understand the birds and how that applies to all the other game on the animal. Can you give us some historical context on this? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jay, Nate, go ahead. Yeah. I, w- I was going to say, Jim, I think the, 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 the best documented stories about that, there's a, there's a book I read many years ago. Um, it's called make prayers to the Raven. And it was uh, it's an anthropologist who did some work with hunters up in uh, Alaska. And it's, it's a pretty extraordinary book. It's probably out of print now. But he he documented really clearly, um, probably for the first time, or it was one of the, the, the first times I, I knew about it, the idea that uh, the intersectionality between ravens and hunt, human hunters and that mm-hmm. the human hunters in, in the – Alaska and, and North, you know, Arctic Circle area of, of North America uh, readily use ravens and, and they, they leave a gut pile out for the ravens. Every time they, they make a kill, they leave the guts for the ravens and the ravens will come down and feed on the um, on the guts. Right. And so as, as like a thank you. Yeah, as like a thank you. And then what happens is then the ravens get conditioned by that behavior. And so they'll actually, and this is a very advanced bird language thing. This is not really the beginning, but they'll actually take the hunters to the elk. They'll call out to the hunters where the elk are. And um, more recently, uh, biologists have documented this same behavior with ravens and wolves. And so you see these, you know, mythological contexts of ravens and wolves being often together in some sort of story, even, you know, European stories, it's, it's pretty common. And so there's this, this symbiotic relationship that's going on there where the ravens actually do, even with wolves, will call out to the wolves where the elk are. And um, I, I've seen this in action. I, I've used this before out in Idaho to, to locate elk before. And so um, when we're talking that's about these super things, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that, you know, Jim, when you were talking about the, the modern technologies that are out there, I love that, that that there's all that tech gear out there. But I think we can really think of bird language. We can think of the things Dan's talking about, about baseline and about the concentric rings. Those are also technologies and they're they're very effective technologies and they have been passed down through generations, um, through different indigenous lineages and in other places as well. And they have a lot to offer us. And, you know, my experience, Jim, has been that when I've worked with hunters with this stuff, they are already unconsciously competent with it. It's like they, they know it intuitively or they've seen it or they've had stories about it, but they hadn't quite made the connection. And then you sort of give them the language, you give them a few tools and all of a sudden they're like, yes, yes, it is the birds. That, that makes let sense. Yeah. 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 God, that's a great point, Nate, too, because when like when we're talking about the the generations of hunters, for for example, I, I know uh I've got I've got old black and whites of uh my grandparents and and some of the the game that they would take and and how they would hunt. They had none of this technology that we I mean they hunted in <laughs> Uh, you know, just everyday clothes, uh, they had, they didn't have $400 boots. They didn't have these no. crazy high technical packs and on X, no scent control, no scent control. <laughs> no, you know, they, they just, they yeah. just were better hunters. And, and a lot of people, yeah. Yeah. they, a lot of hunters blame it on, well, back in the, you know, forties and, and fifties, there was more game. No, there actually wasn't because of hunting and because, because of the conservation movement behind hunting, we have more game now. And so you can't blame it on the game population numbers. 
Uh, and, and so that's that's a time frame that I'm talking about. They they were very effective. And I think that they were just more in tune with nature and the mountain and the birds and the and the wildlife in general. Uh, and that's what so if you if you I guess what I'm trying to say is the people that were more in tune with nature itself and the mountain, uh, they are more effective than a hunter today going out with two thousand yeah. dollars worth of technical gear. Make sense? So yeah, that's and that's that baseline we're talking about. So they already they're they're out of the starting gate hundred yards ahead of us today. Mm -hmm. uh, it, because it, it, it was a simple and it's not like, you know, I'm not going to try and romanticize this. You know, often these are people working their tails off, not making much money. You know, they're close to the land because they can't afford to be going and traveling and doing fancy things. Right. It's, yeah, it exactly. sometimes was a tough life. But the fact is they had that connection already. I mean, and we are, you know, today, you know, the work I did for 20 years you know, in nonprofit with nature connection work, we called it. I mean, that I mean, that stuff. You know, I, I was frightened, uh, you know, as a new dad and raising kids and looking at this world and being like, you know, and this is true today. You know, the average five year old can identify almost 100 corporate logos, but can't tell you 10 plants and animals in its backyard. I know. Isn't that that's disappointing? That's, too. that's it makes me that's, it's just that, that is significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know I heard you talk about stuff you guys do with your kids and all. And I mean, and it takes a lot of work to keep our kids connected to nature. Right. Yeah. So I bring this up because what we're talking about now is this this disconnection is just symptomatic. It's a cultural shift. No one's guilty. No one's bad. No one's wrong. It's just well, where we are, right? This is what we got to work with. So like Nate's saying, we, we, here's the best news. It doesn't really cost you any money. Maybe a couple of books, maybe take a class or two, but that's about it to just get some structure um, to understand this, um, to understand some of these technologies that are really old and really tried and tested. Um, now it's got a bit of a new slant on them. You know, when I teach classes, yeah, when I teach classes on this stuff, I tell people, folks, you already have the, you already have the hardware, like the human brain, body, mind, all our senses are ready for this. You just need a little update. That's all. And, and bam, you're ready to roll. I love it. It's not magic. Yeah. Yeah. It's not magic. Can we talk about some of those, uh, the, the, the basic, like, what do you guys think are a few things that hunters could really benefit from knowing in terms of bird language? We are rolling right into the spring seasons. I'm talking spring turkey, spring bear. We got to get geared up, and I'm here to help. Let's start with Phelps Game Calls. Phelps Game Calls is one of the OG sponsors of the Western Huntsman Podcast, and we appreciate them for being there for us, and I want to be there for them. It's a great company story. It's an American story, the kind we can all get behind, and they make dynamite game calls. And I don't care if you're talking predator calls, waterfowl calls, turkey calls, elk calls. It's all there. It all works. It's a great company, and they've got a great discount for our listeners here at the Western Huntsman. That promo code is Huntsman 10 for 10% 10 off. Heck of a deal. Get your get your stuff. Get your stuff. Go to phelpsgamecalls.com and get your turkey calls and your predator calls because here we go. It's already March. I'm excited. Next on the list is Hoffman Boots, the most badass mountain boot you can get out there. I love Hoffman Boots. This company began in North Idaho years and years and years ago. And they have grown into one of the most recognizable name brands out there. And Hoffman Boots will not disappoint. What I really like about my Hoffman Explorers is they are on par with some of the most expensive hunting boots out there on the market. Yet they're not as much money. That's a huge thing for when, when you're talking about all the gear you got to get for hunting season to save a, a few bucks on, on a product without skimping on the quality of it. That's Hoffman Boots. That's what you're going to get with them. Use promo code HUNTSMAN10, all caps lock, for 10% off on your Hoffman Boots, and you won't regret it, I promise. Last but not least, let's talk about Scree gear. Scree is high-performance hunting attire and gear, scientifically tested camo patterns, which, by the way, they have a new camo pattern coming out this spring that you're going to want to keep your eye on because it's a pretty good camo pattern that they've been testing out all over the country, and it's, it's been working really well. So Scree also is one of those companies with a great story. The name Scree comes from the Scree rock found at the bottom of rock faces. You know, the, the Scree rock in that real rugged type kind of western country, and that's where Scree was developed, and they just changed the spelling on it and came up with Scree gear because like that rugged country, this is rugged gear. It's high-performance hunting attire. Again, like Hoffman Boots, you're not going to break the bank and have to get a second mortgage on it. It's worth the money. Check it out. Go to ScreeGear.com, and don't forget to use the promo code the Western Huntsman for 15% off and free shipping. 
You can't beat it. And folks, I really appreciate you supporting our sponsors that support this show. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Let's get back at it. Is cool. that, is that yeah, too maybe. broad of a question? No, 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 no it's fine. Maybe, maybe we can tag can pass them back. Yeah. There you go. Why don't you, yeah, you want, you want to start and then I'll jump in. Yeah, sure. I'll do a, a couple things. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I think that Dan really hit it when he was talking in his opening piece about, you know, knowing the baseline and then that concentric ring thing. And I'll be honest, I've seen this uh, dramatically in my own life, in my students' lives of, you know, teaching survival skills to people from all over the world for over 20 years you, you teach them a few key components about the ripples you put out, and all of a sudden that really starts to change things. So I'll throw out two things, and then I'll let Dan throw out a couple things. So one of the things is like even starting with when you get you get you pull up in your car <laughs> or your truck, right? As the case may be, and you mm-hmm. you you get to your site, you probably want to pause. You know, because like that truck arriving, even though that site may have traffic or whatever, like it's creating disturbance. It might be minor disturbance, but that's already sending messages out to that that forested landscape or that wide open those meadows, you know, whatever it might be. There are concentric rings already going out. And then you you get out of that that truck, that that vehicle and you're you're going to go out there close that door softly. Like, just like, don't slam the door. Like, I know that sounds like ridiculous, but I say that all the time. It's not ridiculous. Like elk. No, you know, that concentric green that you're talking about, Nate, I think we talked about this last time. And like, you're talking about, you've got this uh, pond and the water smooth as a baby's bottom. Right. And somebody throws a little rock and it creates that ring that just kind of expands and goes and goes and goes. And that's the ring that we're talking about. So slamming your door creates that ring into yeah. the 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 surrounding area of where you just try you know say say a hunter just parked at the trailhead um and, and yeah. that's what we're talking about so i just wanted to clarify that real quick yeah. yeah yeah and and then i think too jim like i think this brings back to a couple pieces from before too like you know i know when i get out there like i'm excited i'm super like i want to go but after i close that door you know go to that trailhead and and just listen and just pause because like all of that disturbance is going out there. And what you basically want to do is let that disturbance die down before you enter into that field. Because if there's already disturbance and then you go out there and you're adding more disturbance, you know, that's basically just sending out lots of ripples. And that's why those those animals, both of you were talking about, you know, any tr- anybody who you know knows anything about track tracking and sign will tell you there's animals all over the place. They, they, they're, they're out there all the time. We don't see them because those ripples are going out so far in front of us. And I've been stunned by, you know, working with the, these skills for, for a while now, how close I can get to animals and how often I can see the animals when you start to learn to do these simple things like that pause. And, and, and you know, I'll, I'll let Dan take a couple at, you know now but i would say yeah that whole thing of like being aware of those ripples and pausing like those things are like you think those are so basic but it's kind of like to use an analogy from the fire book jim it's like a lot of people it seems like they're they're taking the the chunks of wood the green chunks of wood and they're pouring gasoline and light trying to light it with a match to get a good fire it's a similar thing like you know basic fire structure you know there's key components Going into a, a wild area, there's key components that if you know the right kind of code, it sort of gives you the the, the insider approach. So um, those are a couple things I'd recommend. Dan, I'm sure you have uh, some good ideas too. Yeah, yeah, no, appreciate that. Yeah, I got a funny follow up, a little story on that one that Nate just told, and, and that Jim is already practicing. Um, I had a friend who lived in Colorado for a while, and. He started, he was, he was in, he was, a, he was a bow hunter. He was an elk hunter, uh, among other things. And he started to realize these patterns when he would be glassing back towards his truck and the trailhead. And he started to notice that when other people would pull up, whether it was a trail runner, a hunter, a bike, it, it really didn't, it depended just on how they, how they moved and what kind of noise they made. But he would watch these ripples happen. And he started to notice, um, you know, some spots really far away where there were some, some decent elk bedding spots and that, some of them would never get, never get disturbed, and some of them would. 
And basically, like all the other species out there, many of them do this, he became what I call a wake hunter. He decided where to put himself at the right time of day so that when those other people came up, they would force the elk away and right toward him. <laughs> now, a lot it's, of critters that's do this. Such a, that's yeah. such a great story. That, like you, right? you, yeah. you, you opened a whole can of worms with that one. Like <laughs> a hunter yeah. that knows that, right? Has yes, such an yeah. advantage it, over over yes. your average Joe that goes out and just doesn't understand that yeah. ripple yeah. effect and 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 how these how in tune people do not give like again we're going to say it again the, the people do not give these animals enough credit. My father in law told me this story of he he was deer hunting and he's in southern Utah l- overlooking this uh, this kind of open meadow area where there was two big bucks kind of feeding down there. Well the 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 meadow had a trail, like a bike trail through it. Yeah. Uh, and he needed those bucks to kind of move in. There was no way for him to get closer without them noticing. So he was hoping they'd come his way. Well, people would ride their bikes up this trail. Uh, the, the mountain bikers would ride their, their bikes up the trail. And interestingly, about two minutes before they made it to the meadow, the bikers, hmm. the bucks okay. would kind of move off, not, not super alarmed, yep. but they would casually move off behind some brush and literally yep. duck down. The bikes would pass. People never noticed them and they'd come right back out. He said he watched this and this, this went on for, for a couple hours where these deer, uh, yeah. they, they would just simply go. They knew, they knew they were coming that that ripple effect had yeah. hit them. Right. And they just, they hid, they knew what was going to happen. They knew what was going to take place. And then they came back. Yeah. How many hunters, Miss opportunities because of that kind of thing. We we all do. Yeah, <laughs> hey, Jim, I know we, I've we, done it. This is they, Nate. Nate could tell you like that story. It's almost like we could have planted you with that story because we teach our students uh, for so many years about the two minute effect, and it yep. is a thing. It it varies. Oh, really? The two the minutes? Speed. Oh yeah, we call it the two minute effect. Exactly. And, and, yeah, no joke. Crazy. Uh, it's generally well yeah now it does vary depending on the speed of the human whether you're on foot on bike uphill whatever but in general you're talking about those ripples so that that person gets to the trailhead they probably pulled up they were loud they got out they're getting their gear they're taking bikes down whatever they're doing they're making a racket you know there's it's good for them nothing wrong with that that's just whatever yeah but while they're doing that now they've spooked uh the metal larks or they spooked the robins and then as those as they fly off at a certain angle a certain distance and they turn and look back and start to you know versus so they'll go from their song to their alarm or their con or, or some sort of aggressive call that will alert a raven or a crow or a magpie somewhere further off. That will get the deer's attention. And this can all happen really quickly. And they'll just wait and think, and then they'll notice, okay. Then, they'll, then they're listening for the difference in cadence, in intensity. They're watching how those birds are perching on the trees, at what height, where is their body pointing. All these little details tell us what's happening and what's coming. It's an early warning system. And pretty much all the other wildlife, most of the time, are using it. We're the only ones who generally aren't. And mm-hmm. that's why we are at a disadvantage. So um, that that's a perfect story. Um, so great. Yeah. another little t- tip or technology. I love Nate's. I mean, <laughs> I always call pausing the most radical thing you can do in the world. Like, do nothing. Literally <laughs> just stop and do nothing. For how long? Now look at your how, damn phone. How, how long of a okay. pause are you guys talking about? Yeah. It. Um, well, it kind of really depends. It. Uh, and, I mean, this may sound a little... Strange, but it really, first of all, it depends on your frame of mind. I mean, if you're coming out of the car and you just got a text and you're having a fight with your wife or something's going on at work about, and you're, you're kind of a mess or you're just pissed off or you, that kind of energy needs to somehow, you need to do something with that. Because I'm telling you, people, we pick up on energy of each other. Like you ever walk into a room and everyone's talking about you, 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 you can tell. Mm-hmm. Or there, there's something real heavy going on there, you can tell. Why do we think animals can't do this? They also have emotions and they can detect emotion. So if we have some strong, strong emotions, we have to pay attention to that. And we have to discharge, so to speak. Um, so the, how long we stand really does does vary. Um, because, you know, you also want to. So, so, so yeah, I'll answer your question with the second uh, the second uh, thing we're talking about here. So another technique for kind of closing the gap, getting closer uh, to wildlife is, especially for hunters, is to think about the animal who the predator who's a really good hunter of the animal you're seeking. 
So, and, and maybe they're not even around today. Maybe they're extinct because we got rid of a lot of them on this, on this, on this continent a long time ago. But, you know, say if you're out for deer and you're in an area with bobcat or cougar and bobcat don't take a lot of deer, but yeah, sure, they can. They do now and again. Sure. Think about how they move. Think about how they move, right? Think about how cats in general move. Great part about house cats these days is they kept most of their wild instincts, and you could learn a lot about wild cat movement from a house cat. You don't have to watch bobcats because where I live, it's really hard to see anything. We have real thick woods, and you know I've only seen bobcats a handful of times. Whereas I go out west, you can see them quite regularly. Yeah. So you know, so you know, ask yourself, how does a bobcat move? It's an ambush predator. Right. It does not, unlike the coyote, it doesn't trot all day and just hope to spook something up. Or you know, it's stalk. It's just walk, walk, stop look, listen, it's scenting, it's ears are twitching. It's looking I mean, we are eyes on the front, you know, one of my friends, like say eyes on the hunt, better hunt (laughs) eyes on the front likes to hunt eyes on the side. You better hide. Mm -hmm. So we have eyes on the front and we have that binocular vision and we're seeking and we're trying to zoom in on things. But if we're, if we don't stop and we don't look and listen, we are, we are causing those concentric rings to go further and further out. Every time we stop and slow down and we actually look and we listen and we pay attention to the wind, we try and hear is there something going on ahead of us. We all know this as hunters, you know, depending on how, what your style is, you know, guys who do what we call here in New England still hunting, which ironically is really stalking um, yep. as opposed to, as opposed to stand hunting. Right. Um, we're doing this all the time, right? We're just trying to move as quietly as possible, right? On the days where it's good. Maybe it's after a cold rain and the leaf litter is dry, is, is nice and wet and soft. Um, you know, maybe it's um, yeah, just whenever the conditions are great from quietly sneaking around when we know deer maybe are all bedded down and they're not moving around on the rut and we're trying to sneak into a bedding area, who knows? Uh, but when you start to move like that animal, that's a really good hunter of that speed of what you're after, your chances are going to go up. So this is again, knowing baseline, knowing who are the successful hunters in your area, just like we do that with our, our hunting buddies. Right. And that's why we listen to other podcasts and we said like, Oh, that's a great technique. Never knew that trick. So let's, let's remember, let's give the wildlife a lot of credit because they've been doing this. This is all they feed their offspring. This is all they have to survive. Um, so I like to try and think about that. Well, I got, I got a question on that, Dan. Um, when, yeah. when you're talking about, okay, moving, moving slowly, uh, and, and this is going to be super dependent as to what you're hunting. Like when I'm, when I'm yeah. hunting elk in September and they're rutting and yeah. I can just call one in and they're screaming their heads off and they're, they're a lot less alert than they are, yeah. say, in November. Um, yeah. You know, so that's different. I don't, I don't really pay a lot of attention yeah. to how much noise I'm making. Uh, right. However, uh, when you're talking about kind of sneaking through the woods and, and, and trying to imitate some of these predator actions, do yeah. the birds pick up on that in terms of how, like, is that, is that going, going to alert them more than if you were just casually strolling through the woods? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Great question. It really depends. And that you have to pay attention to that too. So the, 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 unfortunately, the answer is it, it depends on uh, on what they're used to. So for instance, I was doing, uh, we created an exhibit at the Museum of Science in Boston, all about bird language. Uh-huh. It's still there. It's been there like 10 years. And and when I was trying to sell the exhibit, the idea to some of the big wigs in the, in the, um, in the place, I did this demonstration. And man, I'll tell you what, if you stalk around... <laughs> In the city, number one, you freak out people. Number two, you freak out the birds. They're not used to people like stopping, looking, listening, sitting down next to a tree. Like I'm telling you, it was fascinating. Whereas if I were yeah. to go at like a, if I were to go at a busy, like rushed walk pace through my backwoods out to the pond a mile, I would spook all those birds. So again, there's a baseline in every place that's different. And that's why paying attention to that baseline and you know, even just, and you don't have to know all these birds' names and all their calls. You just got to know a little bit about them. Where do you usually see that bird? Yeah. Right? yeah. So you know, or you know, as a, and if you're used to seeing a ground bird, like say quail, or um, depending on where you're on the country, uh, you know, sage grouse or something like that, and you know, and you see it now, you know, running around real fast, or it's hopping up into shrubs and, and you know, at the top of a shrub and point, like kind of looking towards you and making a little. You know, like you're like, all right, something's on the ground and that thing's scared of it. You know, maybe there's a rattler there. Maybe there's a weasel. Right. And and they'll do that to us, too. They'll pop up to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so it does really depend on, on the species and what they're used to. Um, and you're right. There's times when doing moving like that is is going to backfire. It's going to be the last thing you want to do. If if, you know, I like to say. You know, most of the deer we eat in my family are the dumb, horny ones, right? So if they're going to be dumb and horny, uh, and same thing with the turkeys, like let them be dumb and horny and just sit still and wait. Yeah, there, there's right? something to be said for that. And I, I ask, I, I guess I ask that question because uh, what what I've kind of noticed 
when let's say I'm, I'm up on the mountain and I, I come across uh, a deer, uh, a doe feeding and she yeah. sees me and I'm act, you know, I'm not after a doe at this point. I'm after a buck. Uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm just kind of watching her and she, she notices how uh, casual I am. Uh, I, I, and she yeah. can see through my body language that I'm not a threat. It's just like, you know, if you're, exactly. if you're hanging out with your dog and, and you're just standing there, he's not going to really pay attention. But if you, if you kind of crouch down and, and act like you're going to come and get him, you know, he jumps up and wants to play, you know, the, the animals could pick up yeah. on this body language. So the same yeah. thing can be said, like with a deer, I've even noticed this with bucks. Um, I can get pretty close to them and they'll, they'll, they'll know when I'm a threat versus when I'm not a threat. And I could stand there and I could look at them. I can even talk to them sometimes and they'll just kind of look mm-hmm. at me. But the moment I draw my bow, <laughs> they're out of here. Yep. Right. So that's, yeah. um, that's uh, yeah. an interesting thing. And so I'm just curious how birds react when, when they're yeah. seeing, you know, obviously he's moving through, yeah. I, by the way, I want one of these ravens that points out where the elk are at. I, I need one of these suckers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It takes, it takes a little while to develop a relationship, Jim. But you, you could do it. You can do it. You just start, you know, start paying attention to where the ravens are and making sure you leave out some guts for them, you know. But um, yeah, I'll yeah, bet the elk have like this snitches get stitches policy against the ravens when they know the, the wolves are, you know, point uh, they're pointing yeah. them out for the wolves and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, huh. Jim, I want to add something onto what you were just talking about, because I I think that, you know, body language is a huge part of this. And so, you know, when we talk about birds and bird language, and I think Dan and I'll probably get into some specifics about that in just a a couple minutes here, but yeah, body language is a huge portion of it. And and I I definitely agree with Dan and a lot of it's contextual. It's like, what's the context. And, you know, when you're talking about your stroll out there where you're getting close to doe and, and even to some bucks, um, you know, you're, you're in your baseline, right? Like when, you know, your personal baseline, your nervous system is probably pretty relaxed. It's not super excited. Yeah. And, and this mm-hmm. is one thing that's very odd. And, and there's a lot of stories about this around the world. I kind of get into this a little bit in primal or whatever, but for whatever reason, there seems to be nothing quite as terrifying to the birds and wild animals as humans, like running along a trail, modern human beings out of, you know, not in their senses, running along a trail or biking along a trail or even just like hiking along a trail. It's like that causes them all to often flee. And so anything you can do to, to work with that profile, you know, your own body language, your own, even your nervous system, like what Dan was talking about, like where, you know, if you're really upset and you're really tense, like even that can kind of agitate those, the, the yep. animals and, and, and the, the piece we haven't yeah. said yet, that I just want to put out there that I think is really important is that, you know, birds communicate all the time with vocally like that. That's that's or a lot of birds do. And the, and the birds we're talking about, the ones you want to pay attention to, that's what they do. That's how they survive. And they're always paying attention. Like that's their job is to pay attention and to communicate to each other about what's going on. And so it's almost like the birds are like a security system, you know, and that yeah. security system has this grid and as you're moving through that grid if you move too fast or you move too intensely it's going to set off little alarms in different sectors and and, and the the one little piece i'll just add here that i think is i find really interesting is that um, and i could go deep on this and i'm, I'm going to try not to get on a tangent but the the sounds that let you know that a bird is alarming are the same sounds or, or are very similar to the same sounds we use as alarms today so like our car alarm or a siren like it's like this repeat repeated high-pitched note over and over like those are the kinds of alarms those are the kinds of sounds we want to pay attention to those are the th- and those are the things we don't want to cause like that's that's pretty interesting and, and I sometimes you know in my sort of view of like our human brain I think our brain's designed to recognize those sounds as alarms and that's why we make our the alarms on our phones and the alarms on our cars and alarms in our security systems have a similar pattern to what we would call a bird alarm. Like when the birds are alarming mm-hmm. about something. Yeah. So can I, can I run, ask like some scenario questions and maybe you guys can help me define them? Sure. Okay. 
Uh, and it, because I think a lot of hunters go through this, you're sitting on, yeah. you're sitting in, in, in like up on a ridge o- overlooking a drainage and it's, it's a, like a mid-sized drainage. Uh, maybe you're uh, hunting deer or elk, whatever, some kind of un- ungulate species up on the mountain, um, across the drainage way out of view, sight, smell, uh, everything from where you're sitting, a bird, does that alarm sound like it, like Nate was just talking about. Yeah. And uh, maybe you see them fly off. What, what does that tell you guys? Well, <laughs> because uh, I, I guess yeah. to, uh-huh. to, to follow up with that question, I yeah. want, I, I, the, the goal is to, for, for me and hunters to kind of understand whether it yeah. was you that triggered that bird alarm or oh, yeah. whether it was something else. Right. Great. No, thank you. That context is helpful. So I could say that most people, uh, it is funny how thing happens where if we haven't been thinking about this topic, um, even though maybe like Nate said earlier, many hunters are already unconsciously kind of practicing things that are trying to decrease the amount of alarms they cause because we don't want to, you know, we're trying to be sneaky. We're <laughs> sneaking around the woods trying to find some game. Mm-hmm. So, um, but once they learn it, one of the first things people often do is they instantly think they're causing all the alarms. This is a pattern I've seen with students over decades. They just, they, I call it the paranoid phase and they, yeah. they hear alarm like, Oh my God, that must've been me. See, and, I, and, I, and I, so, I did yeah. that. I did that last season. Okay. When, like after Nate yeah. and I talked, I thought, yeah. man, I'm, I'm tripping yes. alarms all over the place. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So here's the deal. No, you're probably not. And you're probably tuning okay. into what we call secondary or tertiary alarms. And if it's across a, a an entire, you know, Valley and Ridge, I mean, no way. I mean, unless, yeah, I mean, I can't. It's almost impossible. I mean, we're talking like um, 300, 400 yards away. Yeah, probably not. I mean, birds only, I mean, if birds alarmed at every single thing, they'd be exhausted. They, and they also, when you're alarming, you're also decreasing your own, as a bird, you're decreasing your own sensory integrity. If you're flying away and calling, you're not, you're not quiet listening and paying attention. You're the one who's making the racket. So it's risky to alarm. I mean, there are some species of birds and, and mammals that will, will fake alarms to try and draw in other birds and then attack them. So, um, so in your case, um, chances are it, well, so this is where baseline would really help. So if I knew generally what kind of birds were in that area, what rough size, so you see this thing and you're trying to, you know, you're glassing it and you're like, Oh, I don't know. It's some sort of little sparrowy thing. Well, if, if that bird's usually feeding on the ground and now it flew to the top, we call this a sentinel behavior. We break down a lot of these different behaviors in this book, What the Robin Knows, um, because sometimes those little, sh- we call these shapes of alarm. So in this case, a bird flies up to the top and it's in, 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 in say it does an alarm call and then it's just kind of like staring. And you know, you're like, well, why is it doing that? If you think about it, little tiny bird sitting out on the tip of a branch out in the open is also a sitting duck. Like, a, you know, a, yeah. a, a quick little falcon or a fast exhibitor like a cooper sharpie one of those birds comes by boom it can pick it off so that's a dangerous place to be that bird's risking itself because it's concerned about something and it wants it, it's it's kind of has an agreement with all the other birds that when you see trouble you have to speak you got to you see something you say something in the bird world because everyone's counting on everyone else to pay attention of, of audio vocalization is the fastest way to alert other things to, to tell them what's happening. Mm-hmm. If, you know, so just like us, and like Nate said, and a lot of birds use what we call graded vocalization. So in this case, your little bird across the valley pops up. And maybe this is a bird that is usually sitting on the ground going, maybe there's a little contact call. Mm-hmm. But now it's up higher and you notice the frequency, the duration and the volume of that call, which would be hard to hear at 300 yards to be fair. But <laughs> say you can hear it or you just see something um, or it's closer. Uh, all of a sudden, it goes from to and it's it's going faster, and you're like, and, it, and you actually you can feel it. You're like, that bird's pissed off. What the heck's going on with that bird? Uh-huh. So first things out. First things I'm looking at is where do I expect this bird to be? What is it? What is its kind of uh, zone of comfort? So if it's a bird that's usually down on the ground, and now it's 20 feet up a tree, but it's pointing its body language down to the ground, that makes me say there's a ground predator that pushed that bird up, that spooked it up really close to it. Now, if it's that pissed off, it's probably a ground predator that could either and could eat it or its nest or its young if it's a breeding season. Um, and if it's out of breeding season, then it's probably something that's generally frightened that may Ill- kill it and eat it right then and there. Hmm. It's not going to be, the, it's not going to be, oh, there, it, uh, you know, you know, a couple of a little, 
bachelor group of elk kind of are walking by or something. No, it's probably not that. It's going to be something more threatening. Whereas if the bird just kind of casually pops up, maybe makes one little call, looks back, and then drops down again, then that make me think, oh, it's a subtle, it was a subtle disturbance. And that could be that elk that just came by and it kind of like maybe an elk got out from its bed and or the buck walked 25 yards and sat back down somewhere else that could sometimes around here that kicks up, kicks up the thrushes and the thrushes will make a little call when I see that happen. And then they'll kind of settle back down pretty quick. So there's these gradations of alarm that happen. Um, yeah. Gotcha. So there's one. Yeah. So if, if yeah. you're moving into this same drainage, right. And, and we're, we're talking, uh, let's, let's talk about elk hunting. And a hunter's moving into the same drainage and, and just right in front of him, uh, the, a, a few different birds do give off this alarm and fly away. It's like, you, you know, yeah. you kind of spook the birds. Is that yeah. drainage done? Do you need to go elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> you know, are all the yeah. deer and elk, are they out of there? Well, Hard to say. You def- Yeah, Nate, go ahead, Nate. Well, I was going to say, Jim, so yeah, there, it's kind of yes and no that there's, so we, there's a pretty shapes of alarm. It's kind of interesting because it's kind of an advanced topic, but you know, I think it's, it's probably one of the most useful pieces for hunters. And Dan was just kind of getting at this. So if you do a full on what we call a bird plow, where like all the birds are like fleeing from you because you like stepped on a stick or, you know, or you stumbled or something and you just see bird butts flying away from you. Uh-huh. It's like that then those, you're not going to have a very lucky day or or lucky several hours. But again, it comes back to that pause thing where if, if that happens, if you've rustled up some of those birds, if they, if they're disturbed and you can then just stop and you wait and you wait longer than that two minutes, right? Like, cause it's at least that two minute thing. Um, And you wait till, and till they get back to what they were doing. And when they get back to more of a baseline, and then you walk through there, I think your chances go up. Um, and so, again, it's kind of reading, you know, knowing what what's baseline. And, and to think about things like birds feeding, birds preening, birds singing, these are normal baseline behaviors. And I think that, you know, the two aspects to this that we haven't actually you know, spelled out clearly are one of them is like your own profile. And we've been mostly emphasizing that it's like, you know, working with that, but then also reading what's going on around you. And it's the interface of those two that really, I think, produces the success of seeing more animals and getting closer to them. And so, yeah, you spook those birds. um, But if it's not, you know, a major fleeing incident, then you can potentially recover from that. And and then also, I mean, it depends on, I, I think a lot of its context is like, okay, how, how often are humans coming through there? If humans are coming through there relatively regularly, if there's, there's runners or mountain bikers coming through, you know, like, it, which is, I think, you know, a lot more common these days in a lot of the places we're talking about, then sure. you're going to have a, re- a quicker recovery of that, that spot, right? Because they're used to having humans the birds do get disturbed by humans and the deer and the elk are used to those little disturbance waves coming through versus if you're in a pretty remote area and then you disturb the, the birds pretty significantly, it may be a while before things get back to baseline. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I guess that's, that brings up, you mentioned something that brings up another question. Uh, I told you I'm, I'm all over the place with this stuff. <laughs> so bear with me. You're sitting there. You're sitting there and, and you know, in most of the people that listen to this show uh, are Western hunters and we're, we're many times very far back into the back country. There's not mountain bikers. Yeah. There's not a lot of, you know, day yeah. hikers or anything like that. Uh, okay. So, so w- with that in mind, uh, human interaction with birds is a rare thing. Um, and, and so let's say a hunter is, is sitting, okay. uh, he's in the woods, he's in the back country. Uh, and and doing what what Dan was kind of demonstrating, where the bird is just kind of singing. It's it's uh, making. I can't replicate the noises you made, Dan. Uh, but um, they're just casual. Wow. They're making noise. They're chirping. They're yep. uh, singing. Nothing nothing is alarmed. But then suddenly, all the birds and, and, and to include like chipmunks and squirrels, they, you know, they're they're casually mm-hmm. making noise. All of a sudden, Absolutely. it goes yep. dead silent. What what oh, does that tell man. a hunter? Good one. So 
All right. So, yeah, when we talk about these shapes of alarms, there's um, different species can have different kind of signatures or shapes that they cause. So the kind of sometimes we call it a tunnel of silence or sometimes we call it like uh, just like a pillow of silence, like everything gets muffled and mushed down and quiet. So it so it depends on what birds we're talking about, first off, um, because you know, some birds are more likely to be prey to certain predators than others. So in general around me, yeah, or, you know, and I've spent, I've, I've, I've been out in the mountain West, you know, a decent bit, not a ton, but if I hear a number of birds, especially if it's a diverse group of birds singing or, or feeding and just kind of doing their baseline stuff. And then all of a sudden it gets quiet. I'm generally assuming that there's a very effective bird predator in the area and probably a, a raptor. So bird of prey. So something that it, that specializes on eating birds because they do not want to be detected. And especially if they freeze in place, like if they get really quiet and they're not really moving, then that means there's one really, really close. And in that case, I would say just listen really carefully um, because they're often they're doing really high pitched alarms, things like, like, so I might even hear when I do it. Like super, super stuff. That's ventriloquial. They can't even, so a predator can't detect it. Say that, that falcon can't even tell where the heck that noise is coming from. Mm -hmm. So rarely do you get that kind of a pure thing of silence happen from, say, an elk, for instance. Um, however, bear... What about a grizzly bear? Oh, you said it. I was going to say, I just said it. Bears will cause huge chunks of silence sometimes. Sometimes. It really depends, again, on the bear's body language, you know, on the bear's intention, on what the bear appears to be doing, where it appears to be going. See, um, that always mm -hmm. makes me nervous. So I hunt a lot in, yeah. in like, grizz country. And, and mm -hmm. I'll be sitting there and all of a yeah. sudden the woods, uh, both birds yeah. and squirrels, everything. It just is like, all of a sudden yeah. there's this eerie dead silence and it's like, I could yeah. feel the presence of something. Okay. And, and I don't, that, I, I yes. go on high alert mm -hmm. at that time. Like I'm whistling up an, an alert sound like the birds are, you know, but <laughs> you, you know, and so, uh, that's always interesting. I just want, I, I want hunters to be aware just from a safety aspect, if, if bears can create. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, and I, I worry a lot less about black, black bears than I do with grizzlies. Uh, and so that it's interesting you bring that up. Yeah. And, yes. and I have a comment on that too, Jim. I just want to say that, you know, that's, again, we kind of tur turn back to like indigenous lore about these kinds of things, right? Like these stories that have been passed down, the, the kinds of things Dan, Gar Dan was talking about at the beginning of the program with the 12,000 years of, of knowledge. And it is definitely a, a theme in these stories, you know, uh, that one where the, all the animals spoke the same language. Another theme that's been passed down in that folklore is if all the animals go quiet, it's, it's, we need to pay attention and there's a, a potential threat. And, and yeah, maybe it's just a sharp shinned hawk. Maybe it's just a Cooper's hawk. Maybe it's just a, a peregrine falcon, like, or it's a large predator, you know? And yeah. yeah. And that body, that body instinct you're talking about jim that that like feeling in your gut like you feel something's going on like that's exactly what the animals are paying attention to all the time and it, and that's one of those things that just gets um kind of dulled out by our society by our screen time and our you know all of our other being on our devices we kind of get a little disconnected from that um but yeah, it's the same sure. thing i guess if you go into the city you know and you know there's certain places in the city and you're just like wow like the vibe here is just really different. And I got to be really aware right in this section of the city. You know, even if you don't know anything about that part of the city, you just know, mm -hmm. oh, like the body language of the people, it's a similar thing. But, and, and I think that that's one of the the fun things about the, this, this work is like uncovering that lore, you know, and those stories stay around for a reason, you know, um, you know, when you talk about survival, when you talk about hunting, when you talk about bird language, like those are, those elements are not there for no reason. They were, they were remembered and shared with us for, for good reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Um, I, I love this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, is there, okay. And this is the last along the, the circumstantial or I'm sorry, the, the scenario kind of driven questions. Um, is there something that birds or other, you know, smaller wildlife such as squirrels and, and chipmunks and, uh, what not when you're in, when you're in the woods, it can kind of alert somebody that's that's in the back country to bad weather. Does that make sense? A sudden thunderstorm mm, coming yeah. in or something along those lines. Is there something that we, yeah. we could learn from that? So, 
Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, there's, it's, I mean, it's no surprise, but I often have to say there's plenty of research that backs it up because there is. <laughs> and when I was doing the, all the science editing for this book, What the Robin Knows, um, I had to find that stuff because if we're going to put it in print, we needed to be able to back it up. Sure. But of course, animals can detect things like uh, serious changes uh, in the barometer. That's what we use, right? So we, are, we know the pressure's dropping. We know there's probably an incoming low pressure system. That means there's probably inclement, inclement weather coming. And if that drops real fast and real real hard, we can sometimes even feel it ourselves. So if we see, again, this comes back somewhat to baseline, but if it's a place you hunt regularly and all of a sudden th- this day, you know, you're kind of wondering, ah, what's going on with this weather? I don't, you know, you don't, you can't, you can't check the weather. You're out of service. And you're trying to figure it out. If you see a big flurry of feeding activity, yeah. big flurry feeding activity from birds, from small mammals, uh, more so than usual, there's a, they, that is very common for them to do, especially before pretty serious um, low pressure systems. And, you know, especially up in the mountains before big dumps of snow and um, things like that. So uh, an unusual, and again, so it's all relative, it's relative to baseline, but if it yeah. seems like it's an unusual amount of activity and it may be at a time of day when they're usually they're quieter, you know, you're like, all right, yep, I, I think my gut's right here. I might want to get down to lower elevation for a while or, or whatever, or get ready to, you know, get camp ready for a couple of days of being socked in. Okay. Good. And, yep. and this, you guys were talking about, uh, you have, you have this class coming up in April. Uh, is that stuff, yep. the, is that the kind of thing you're going to be teaching in this class? And probably a, obviously a lot more in depth than we can get in a podcast, but is, can you give us an idea of what yeah. that class is going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the goal is to, oh, yeah, sorry, we're going to have a, yes, yeah, it's a six part class. Um, it'll be 90 minute sessions and Dan and I are going to co-teach it. And, and really, uh, the goal is to, to give people the tools to work on both sides of those things we were talking about, like the, the tools to lower your profile and to, to, to learn the baseline around you and then also to start reading the, the bird language, the, the animal language out there outside of you and to, to bring those together. And, and you know, we're going to gear it towards the idea of people being able to get closer to and see animals more regularly. Um, it's not going to be exclusively designed for hunters, but it, it'd be for anybody who wants to see more animals. But that's definitely the, the goal is to like basically deactivate all of that alarm system we're talking about and, and mm-hmm. see what can happen. For people. Yeah. So some, you know, and, and we'll, we'll share stories. We'll, we'll put, you know, plenty of science in there. I know with Dan, especially like he's really good at the research end of this, this stuff and making sure we're, you know, we're not just pulling things out of, you know, nowhere. Um, so that's that's the idea behind the class. And um, yeah, and, and to make it a, a place where people can bring their questions like the, I mean, all those. Yeah. Just, and those are excellent questions. And to, to really be able to work with those things. You know, I, it. Uh, OK, it leads me to one more question here. I, I apologize. I, I know we're running a little bit long, but um, when when we're talking about how the birds and and the alarms and and things of that nature alarm the prey animals such as deer, elk, ungulates, you know, any kind of ungulate yeah. or, or mammal. Um, in terms of predator hunting, so we're 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 coming into spring. Spring bear mm-hmm. season is coming up, um, and it's a big yeah. deal in in my neck of the woods. Uh, does does this stuff still pertain in the same kind of way to things such as bear? The the way they get alerted through birds are are they as attentive to birds and what the birds are doing and saying? as uh, a prey species is absolutely 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 yeah um you know so the first things i'd be asking you know thinking about that is all right where wherever i usually do my spring bear hunt what else is there like I, you know so the trick here is as hunters we got to be careful not to just put ourselves in these little narrow boxes just think about the bear let's think about the habitat right we all talk about hunting the habitat so what what is the habitat what you know so what are bears what are they looking for in food when they first, you know, come out of hibernation or a month or two later? There's a real, there's a real change. It really does change depending on where you are. Like where I am, they're often looking for uh, a lot of root vegetables or a lot of roots. They're looking for green shoots. Then they shift over to more meats like around here. Fawning season's a big time for the bears to go after them. Oh yeah. So I want to ask myself, what are the bears after right now? And where are the places that those things are most likely to be found? And who are the other animals around there who I need to pay attention to? So is it ground squirrels? 
Is it, um, is it us, you know, little birds on the ground? Is it tall, taller birds up high in the street? So depending, I'm asking myself, what are the other things there that I really want to pay attention to? So I'm not just thinking about the bear, uh, because the bear is definitely paying attention to them too. Cause you know, if you're trying to sneak up on that bear, um, it's hungry, it's looking for food, but it's also listening to see if, you know, if you get, you get busted on your way in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're definitely listening. To okay. Good to know. Good to know. So I uh, hope yeah. you guys are listening. Bear, bear hunter coming up. Uh, we, we got season opening here in less than a month at this point. And so, wow. uh, just uh, that, that ripple effect that we were talking about earlier, all that's going to apply to, to predator hunting as well. Yeah. Um, I swear, uh, wolves are keyed in a little bit better than any game species I've ever seen in my life anywhere mm-hmm. on the planet. But, um, other than that, uh, this has been a great conversation, guys. I, I really appreciate this. This is, I, I feel like we can go on for like two more hours. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> can you yeah. guys, uh, tell, tell the audience where you can be found. I know Dan, we talked about leadwithnature.com and Nate is uh primal nate.com. Obviously those are going to be in the show notes where else, or what else would you want the audience to know about you guys uh, as we're, as we're moving forward here? Yeah, I can start Nate. Uh, I'll then Nate, you think, think about what you're going to say and you can, you can close it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, I, um, you can find me on Instagram, lead with nature, Facebook, lead nature. Um, I, I put out a decent bit of content. Um, I have a whole series called learn a bird series, and those are mostly about getting to know basics of birds so that again, we can build that baseline knowledge. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I teach a number of different online classes depending on, I just did one all about um, my other specialty is wildlife tracking. I just did a, a couple of courses specifically on winter wildlife tracking. I had people from, you know, Alaska, Arizona, you know, California, you name it all over the place, East coast, West coast. Um, so yeah, all sorts of stuff there. And those and are, those are book. online courses. Yeah. Yeah, I t- yeah, because of COVID, I've shifted a bunch, and actually, they've gone pretty well. It's been really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So oh, I, and I found them. Yeah. I'm on your website now. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them aren't posted right now because they're closed. But uh, yeah, I mean, I do winter ecology. All you know, I taught as a professor for ten years at a local university, and then I've changed those to be more grounded kind of courses. And finally, that book I mentioned a couple times. Uh, it's called What the Robin Knows: How Birds Revealed the Secrets of the Natural World. John Young is the author, and he's been a mentor for both Nate and I. Um, amazing guy. I was really found language to put to this ancient practice and habit of, you know, people's all around the world for, for a lot, long time. And I think it's an interesting book for, uh, it's not really designed for hunters, but I think it, it'll really be a nice, uh, little bit of knowledge to have. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Good deal. How about all you, right, Nate? Nate? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you can definitely find me at, uh, primalnate.com and, uh, get on my mailing list there. I, I have also in the strangeness of the COVID world shifted a lot of my teaching to online. I, in fact, I can't even really remember the last time I taught in person. I'm hoping in 2021, I can teach some classes in person. Right. I am uh, ready. I'm ready to like have in-person oh yeah. stuff again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, me too. yeah. And Jen, we've talked about me coming out your neck of the woods and maybe doing something at some of the hunter training stuff you do sometime. I'd love to do a bird language thing there or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, people can get my mailing list. I, I'm also on Instagram at Primal Nate. Um, and then, yeah, I would recommend people check out my book, Primal. It's just a great, like, overview of a lot of the things we're talking about and goes into other core areas like survival and full of stories. And if you want if you want to, you know, learn more about Fire too, Awakening Fire is is coming out. There's a review for Awakening Fire in this month's Backpacker magazine. That's it's uh, It does a great job of of you know, talking a little bit about the book and how it's a really fun read. It's not dry. It's full of stories and things like that. And I always, um, you know, let everybody know as an author, you know, it's hugely important to get reviews on Amazon, like, you know, just people getting the word out. So if you do pick up either of those to put a review, throw a review up on Amazon would be super helpful. Yeah. For um, sure. And yeah, any of your listeners too, uh, Dan and I have, decided we're going to, you know, have a, an early bird, uh, special for anybody, um, you know, listening to this podcast to join us in April for our, our six part course. And so we'll have the details available for that. And you called that, uh, the, the decoding wildlife course or, or it's, did you guys, yeah, it's called, yeah, it's going to be called decoding nature's language, getting closer to wildlife, decoding <clears throat> nature's language, nature's getting closer yep. guys listening to yep. this. Um, if, if, if you've wondered, you know, what maybe the secret 
to some of these uh, hunters out there that seem to harvest everything they go after. Uh, a lot of it boils down to the basics. It, when, when we're talking about all the, all the, and you guys know I, I love to talk about gear, but if you strip away all the fancy gear and the expensive uh, technology and all the things that, that make hunters successful, when, when you really uh, take that out and get to the essence of what makes a hunter really successful on a consistent basis, this is the kind of stuff that would help you get there. This uh, applying, decoding, uh, the gosh, I'm sorry. I I was trying to type that as you said, decoding. Say the class name <laughs> nature, again. Decode. Yeah, it's decoding nature's language. Decoding nature's language. Yeah. I would encourage you guys yeah. to jump on and take right. that course. I'm probably going to take that depending on the time frame. Um, and I would I would love more information on that. Uh, and and that I think any hunter, uh, if you're a serious hunter, you would benefit from that kind of course. This is that's the kind of stuff that is going to make you a better hunter. So. Um, gosh, guys, this, this has been a fun conversation. They're totally different than what we usually do on this show. This was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, right? Jim. I appreciate yeah, That's been nice. Uh, yeah. Appreciate it too. And, uh, I look forward to checking out some more of your podcasts and, uh, yeah, hope to hear from some of your listeners. Good deal. Well, uh, you know, my yep. show where sometimes we do serious ones like this, other times we do complete satire. So, uh, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> so I appreciate it again, guys. <laughs> Uh, th this has been awesome, Nate. I'm looking forward to Awakening Fire. Uh, I'll grab I'll grab a copy as soon as they're available. I'm uh, that that'll be a good read for sure. A lot of people will benefit from that. Um, so thanks again, guys. Any any closing thoughts? Uh, I would just say that um, you know every time we go out in nature and we you know whether we're hunting or whether we're listening to the birds or whatever it is. We're doing something really good for ourselves and that our brains get really happy when they spend time in nature. And I don't really need to tell anybody that who, who's listening to this podcast, but you're really getting in touch with, you know, what your your human brain and body is designed to do. And just like, don't forget that and, and you know, make sure you make time for mm -hmm. that. Totally agree. Yeah. Can't argue that. Not, not yeah. a bit. Well, cool. Thanks again, guys. Looking forward to having you on the show uh, in the future. Let's keep in touch. And uh, I, we're going to have a, a great spring hunt because of some of the information that uh, we, we learned on this show. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.